आई काया राम का मंदिर अरे इना मंदिर की शोभा प्यारी इना मंदिर की शोभा प्यारी शोभा जब है सुंदर साधु भाई तन राम का मंदिर इट इज नॉट जस्ट रिलीजन don't uh, push them aside as religion it is the desire to maintain the highest form of civilization yeah a tree is a temple a flower is a temple a fruit is a temple according to hindu tradition the human body itself is temple देहो देवालय प्रोक्तो हा तन राम का मंदिर साधु भाई काया राम का मंदिर वी एज ह्यूमन बीइंग्स वुड लाइक टू क्रिएट समथिंग न्यू ए सिंपल स्ट्रक्चर ए हट इज अ टेंपल यस इट इज अ टेंपल बट यू आर्टिकुलेट सेवरल आइडियाज several uh, philosophical ideas through the structure and where these are done according to prescribed texts which are called vastu this prescribed textual construction makes it a classical temple in the forest there is no structure but you put an image there and worship it you ask our people they will say this is a temple where is the structure there is no structure there is an image then the whole forest is the temple according to yog certain points in the human body are more energetic and purer yog also regards certain places on earth as more energetic and pure These splendid places of divine presence are called kshetra or tirtha. The Mahabharata has described hundreds of such places as tirthas. People have been going on pilgrimage to these tirthas from time immemorial. The position of these tirthas created a sacred map of India which is deeply imprinted in the minds of Hindus. therefore they long for an undivided india but they also know that the real tirtha is the mind that mind which the pool of patience filled with the crystal clear water of truth is a tirtha a person who practices non possession and has risen above the duality of life is also a tirtha Indians with their holistic world view perceived the inner and outer world as deeply connected. When a man manifests divine inner experience into the world by means of vastu shastra then the structure that is created is a temple. A temple is a creative communication of the inner experiences into the outer world. The word temple became popular much later. In Sankhya, the philosophy of yoga, the word that is used for consciousness is purusha, meaning that which resides in the pura or boundary. Consciousness resides in pura. In Bali, Indonesia, temples are still called pura. Before the construction of these pura simple pavilions were made for dhyana meditation and even before these there were yagya mandapas pavilions of fire altars a yagya vedi is made within the premises of temples even today these all come from vedic altars in vedic tradition you have different types of uh, altars were built so depending upon to which deity that uh, altar is used the shape varies and it is from those altars which were done according to mathematical calculation of the vedic age the temples also 
were laid out according to square, rectangle, and so on. So they are derived directly from the Vedic altars. These pavilions were made from perishable things like wood and bamboo. So to understand Veda, you need six limbs. Similarly, to understand a temple, a Hindu temple, you have six basic angas, basic parts in the vertical level. One is called Adhisthana, the base. The second is called Bitti, wall. The third is Cornish, Kapotha. Then Griva is neck. And then the head is Sikhara. And then Stupi. Stupi is the topmost part. Then each Anga is further subdivided into, for example, the Adhisthana is divided into Kura, Jagati, Kumuda, and Patrika, and so on. There are articulated moldings. They give you architectural beauty. And this beautiful structure, construction, is connected with the constellations, the nature. The education of a Hindu used to begin with the study of the script, design, and arithmetic from the age of five to the age of 12. This rock edict, dated 163 BC, says that the great Jain king Karvel, after finishing his basic education at the age of 16, further studied the script, design, and mathematics in detail for the next nine years to master them. Around that time, several treatises were available on town planning and temple architecture, based on design and mathematical calculations. They say that the first step in building a temple is the selection of land. When selecting the site, they were not only careful about ventilation and light, etc., the landscape itself was very thoughtfully decided. The importance of higher and lower plains, the size and shape of land, the forest and vegetation, the rivers and lakes around, all find a place in these texts. These texts describe how the abode of the gods should be. What is the reason that on the skyline of Varanasi, this mosque is visible and not the adjacent Kashi Vishwanath temple? It is because the mosque is standing right at the sacred spot of the landscape, which makes it look prominent. The architects of the sacred temple had once chosen that point. So, the Vastu texts prescribe how to select a beautiful site for building a temple. The selection of the site of a temple cannot be based only on physical factors. There is much more than that. Once Adi Shankar was passing by this place, he was wonderstruck on seeing a scene. A pregnant female frog was in labor pains suffering under the hot sun. A nearby snake was protecting her with his hood. The Acharya immediately decided to build a temple there. At the site of a temple, the life-giving energy should always be greater than the life-destroying energy. It is through temples that the life-giving energy flows into society. These sacred places were either destroyed or seized, and with this, the life-giving Vastu structure of India was severely damaged. The whole cosmos into it, level the ground, and draw a sort of grid on it. Generally, according to Indian tradition, 80 into 864 squares, or 9 into 9, 81 squares, and in the center of it, we invoke the presence of God in the sanctum. Around it, we distribute all the nature's power symbolically. There need not be any figure, but the space itself is invoked as the cosmic powers. For example, the square 
which is divided into 8 into 8, 64, or 9 into 9, 81, will have a central 9 into 9. 9 squares will be there in the center. That is what we call the Garbha, Garbha Graha, where the Sanctum Tower is erected. Surrounding it, we have several squares, and these are divided into 12 squares. These 12 squares represent the 12 months of the year, which we call the Surya, the movement of Surya, the sun, through the 12 months. And these small squares at the outer, they are considered the nakshatras, the stars, which are localized. And then you have also got the constellations, grahas. So, Nakshatra, Graha, Tara, Mandala. Brahma created the cosmos. Brahma dwells within this cosmos. In Sanskrit, dwelling means Vas. Therefore, the cosmos is the dwelling, the Vastu of Brahma. Brahma is infinite and directionless. Formless Brahma is infinite and directionless. On seeing this with divine eyes, a warrior like Arjun was filled with fear. He calmed down only after seeing the four-armed form of Vishnu. The four-armed form of the formless is this. One gets a sense of direction from this form and the mind is at peace. The square is a geometric form. Yantras are made from squares, triangles and circles. Yantras are forms that can become vehicles for spiritual power. There are many yantras. The Buddhist temple of Borobudur is a Sri Yantra built on multiple triangular shapes. Therefore, the square is the fundamental dwelling place of Brahma, called the Vastu Purush Mandal. Generally, dwelling places of humans are square-shaped and temples are also built in square shapes. We call Dig Devatas. They are the personified eight directions. Then you have one down and one up, or localized in the Vastu Pada. In the center is the supreme deity which you install. It manifests in different forms. The shapes of cuboids, pyramids, prisms are found in many civilizations. But the immense beauty of the curved shikhar is found only in Indian civilization. The Khajuraho temples, you know, they were conceived as mountains, either Kailasa or Meru. So, and that is also mentioned in their inscription that the king built the temple like Meru that is for the Vishnu temple, or if it is a Shiva temple like Kailasa. And even they have shown the temples like mountains by having graded spires, you know, the main, main shikara is there. On it are the multiples of the shikaras, which are very, very gracefully, very, what you call, uh, they are arranged very rhythmically on the, on the main spire. So you can see, Ascent and descent of spire, you know, as Stella Cramrish describes in a Hindu temple, you know, ascent and descent, you know, reminding us also of the creation and dissolution of the universe, you know. So that sort of, and when the light falls on them in, in, at twilight, in, at Sandhya, you can see the rhythm so well. Uh, you can experience the rhythm, particularly in the Kandariya Mahadev temple. Indian architects blended geometrical shapes with nature to create an amazing rasa of beauty. An awestruck person wonders, are these the five shikharas of the Sumeru mountains or the closed buds of the lotus? Ancient Indians believed that the absence of beauty is inauspicious. Therefore, they used to decorate their walls beautifully. Beautiful in Sanskrit is Sur, which means Devta. 
They envision devtas even in the mountains. Here, the undesired stone was chiseled away and an abode of devtas was revealed. This is the most amazing temple on earth. The court historians of the Islamic invaders who destroyed it wrote that the attack on this temple was an attack on beauty itself. Several Muslim rulers destroyed it many times, but even in its mutilated and burnt form, it is a wonder of the world. Painted with flower, vegetable and gold colors, how magnificent it must have looked in its original grandeur. An inscription says that when the Devtas saw it from their celestial vehicles, Biman, they were awestruck by its splendor and beauty. They said, it cannot be merely an artistic creation. It is self-manifestation, a Swayambhu. In fact, Swayambhu is Brahma. We find its indication in the temple. Indication here means Linga. Smoke is the indication or the Linga of fire. The way smoke is the Linga of fire, the same way the cosmos is the Linga of Brahma. There are three realities of the cosmos. There is a beginning and there is a dissolution of the cosmos. In between, there is a state of preservation. The geometrical form through which these three realities are understood is called the Linga. This cuboid represents the creator, Brahma. Emerging from the top of this cuboid is a cylindrical form. This is the preserver, Vishnu. His creative presence in the cosmos is understood in the 8, 16, 32 and 64 facets of color, the arts. But in the end, this beautiful world dissolves into formlessness. The last end part represents Mahakal, the end of time. Through continuous Abhishekam with water, we try to slow down the process of destruction. O Shambho, let there be no untimely death. Creation, preservation and dissolution. These three forces could not have created the world if there was no Shakti, the power to hold them together. She is the Yoni, womb of the world. There are some references in the Puranas where Linga and Yoni are associated with the procreative parts of the human body. Nature in the human body and the sculptor in the idol both have taken this form from the core of creation. There is no darkness of animalistic lust in the primordial core. The conscious energy there is radiantly luminous. The Linga Purana says that Linga is Jyoti, Param Jyoti. The body is a mini cosmos. The Muladhar of the cosmos is described in the form of Jyotir Linga. And the same is described for our Muladhar. Here, the primordial energy lies in the form of Kundalini. The upward movement of this energy is blissfully celebrated by the yogis and householders celebrate it in procreation. Kama is a devta here, known as Kamdev. Before the arrival of intolerant religions in India, there were temples of Kamdev all over the country. Young men and women used to go there for worship and celebration. The same celebration later turned into the festival of colors, Holi.
At the onset of spring, nature and humans celebrate with colors together. This celebration for Indians is an expression of gratitude towards the powers of nature. These powers are devtas. But who are these devtas? Amar Kosh, one of the oldest dictionaries of Sanskrit, gives many synonyms for Devta. The first two are Amar, the immortal, and Nirjhar, that which does not decay. Devtas are different forms of our consciousness. Consciousness is immortal, therefore Devtas are immortal. And consciousness never decays, therefore Devtas never get old. Now you know why devtas are always shown as youthful. In Sanskrit, the origin of words is very logical and scientific. Rishis composed a treatise called Nirukta to explain the origin of Vedic words. Rishi Yask in his Nirukta explains the origin of the word deva as devodanadva, tyonadva, deepnadva. Meaning, the nourishing powers are devtas, self-illuminating powers are devtas, and energy-giving sources are devtas. According to the Mahabharat, the characteristic of the devta is light. Devtas illuminate our intellect, emotions and senses with knowledge. That is why they are experienced indirectly. We cannot see devtas, but they are always watching us closely. The Veda says there are 33 types of devtas. This human body is not ours alone, but a dwelling place of many devtas. The earth is the devta of our body. The sun is the devta of eyes. The moon of our emotions. Fire is the devta of digestion, and so on. Veda says that the relation between humans and devtas is that of equals. Both nurture each other. The divine powers of nature nourish human beings, and in turn, humans make offerings with reverence. This is known as yagya. But for both, only physical nourishment is not enough. Tapa, penance, and dhyana, meditation, also nurture them mutually. When the Buddha and Mahavir did tapas, devtas showered flowers on them. It is said that when devtas are pleased with the good deeds of humans, they shower flowers on earth. Humans and devtas nurture their emotional well-being through kalas and vidyas, arts and knowledge. Devtas are formless, but want to take forms. So they appear in the minds of artists and take form in stones through their hands. In India, there was never a time in history when the idols of Devtas were not worshipped. Idol worship is one of the longest continuities of India. In spite of the Gyan of the Upanishads, and meditation of the shamans, Hindus have always worshipped devtas in nature and in stone. This world is perceived by a name and a form. When the name and form of a devta expresses itself in stone or wood, it becomes a devta personified. This is known as archa avatar, manifestation of a deity to worship. The idol itself is not the devta. Devta is in the form. Devta is in the bhav of the form. In Sanskrit, bhav means an emotional state of being. This state of being is a state beyond the intellect. This bhav 
is full of rasa, emotional feelings. Raso ve saha, verily, that Brahma is rasa. So existence is also full of rasa. Are the arts through which human beings experience rasa a psychological phenomenon? Are pleasure and pain experienced only in the human brain? Dr. Ramachandran is one of the world's leading brain scientists. His experiments have been proved to be revolutionary. Until about 50 years ago, 30 years ago, or even 20 years ago, the standard model of brain function was that there are highly specialized modules. So there's a serial, hierarchical, modular, bucket brigade organization of brain. Partially true. It's a good working hypothesis when, when they began this research. The work of many of my colleagues and some of my work shows the opposite. But each of these modules, far from being completely hardwired, there's a basic scaffolding that's laid down by genes. Shows a tremendous malleability. Mrigan Kasur, for example, at, at MIT, was one of my colleagues, he has shown very elegantly that in, in a very young ferret, visual area can be taken over by auditory input. Then it becomes auditory, the cortex. But the modules concerned with vision don't do just vision. They come and influence touch and proprioception. So vision eliminates pain. He studied the patients who had lost their limbs or had undergone amputation. He called the absent limb a phantom limb. Patients experience pain and feelings in their phantom limb. This is real, not just psychological. This is not some psych psychic mumbo jumbo or, or some telepathy or anything like that. This process is, is evident in, our, in all our experiments. But my watching you poke with a needle affects my pain regions. And say, I'm almost tempted to say, ouch, and pull my hand away. Feel your pain. Neurons are fine. But I don't literally feel the pain. Otherwise, I'll go crazy. But because the skin here is intact and it's telling me, don't worry. Empathy, empath empathize with this person. You know what it's like to experience that person's pain, but don't feel it because you're normal. Don't, don't worry. But if I remove the skin, this is what we found, amputate, then I feel your pain. You poke you with a needle, I say, ow, I feel it. You don't merely say, I empathize with your pain. You literally feel it. But that veto signal is gone. Clinically, you can apply this because if, if I feel excruciating, excruciating muscle aches and pain in the phantom, there's nothing I can do about it traditionally. Now we have proved if I just watch you, your arm being massaged, I feel the phantom massage in my phantom, eliminating the phantom pain. This shows the, the extent of interaction. So you interact, the brain modules are interacting with the skin, with each other, bottom up, top down, and with other brains, other human brains. And this is an extraordinarily dynamic system, very different from your average computational model of vision. This means that the consciousness of the limb exists even without its physical existence. Modern science knows very little about consciousness. Vedic rishis not only experienced consciousness in human beings, but also in plants and animals, and even in all inert matter. मुझे चेतना मनुष्य में दिखाई देती है इतनी बात नहीं है पशु पक्षी में दिखाई देती है इतनी बात नहीं है पेड़ पौधों में दिखाई देती है इतनी बात भी नहीं है मुझे वह चेतना पत्थर में भी दिखाई देती है This world is but a play of the consciousness Therefore the Ved says that the 16 colors forms of art of the creator is holding the cosmos. There is a discipline to experience the world through colors. And its purpose is liberation. For this discipline, the Vedic Rishis created a treatise called Natya Shastra. I believe that Natya Shastra is the first time with Rigved. There are the same things in Yagya, and there are the same things in Yagya. So, just as the performance comes, Shastra also comes with the same things. How do 
पुरोहित यहाँ खड़ा होगा जो सोम खरीदने वाला है वो यहाँ खड़ा होगा वो इस तरह से बोलेगा वो एक यज्ञ के बीच में एक नाटक वो खड़ा करते हैं उसका मैनुअल है ब्राह्मण ग्रंथों में कि वो ऐसे ऐसे कहेंगे इस दिशा में देखेंगे इस एवं परिक्रमा करेंगे ये सारी जो क्रिया है वो नाटकीय है और उसके लिए एक एक मैनुअल तैयार किया जा रहा है तो नाट्यशास्त्र तो कई हज़ार साल पहले ऋग्वेद के समय से ही चल पड़ा अब जो हम कह रहे हैं बात की वो ज्ञान की एक धारा है मौखिक परंपरा में है उसके सारे निर्देश उनको कोई फिर संकलित करता है उनका डॉक्यूमेंटेशन करता है तो संविधा बन जाती है तो एक नटसूत्र में एक संविधा बनी जिसके कि लेखक भी शिलाली कहे गए और शिलाली मूलतः वैदिक पुरोहित है जो वेद में यज्ञ कराने वाले पुरोहित हैं तो शिलाली ने उस वैदिक यज्ञ की प्रक्रिया में जो नाटक होते हुए देखे थे उन उनके हिसाब से एक नटसूत्र कोई लिखा फिर कोई आदि भरत हैं वृद्ध भरत हैं फिर भरत मुनि आते हैं और भी कई आचार्य हैं जो कि नाट्यशास्त्र उसकी परंपरा में उल्लिखित होते हैं On its completion, he offered it to the devtas, who refused to receive it. They said, "We cannot hold this natya because we cannot perform the penance and meditation necessary for it. Only a yogi can hold it." So Adi Yogi Shiva accepted and was called Natraj. Natya Shastra, in a way, is a treatise of yoga. A yogi sees the drama of the world within himself. Shiva Sutra, a treatise of yoga, says, "For a yogi, the actor who plays in the drama of the cosmos is his own self. The stage in this cosmic dance is nothing but the inner being, Antaratma. The spectator of this cosmic dance." is one's own cognitive and sense organs ha natya ka prayojan bharat muni ne jo bataya ki log jo sansar ke sukhi aur dukhi hain apne apne dukhon mein doobe hue hain thake haare hain jeevan ke prapanchon se ghabraye hue hain unko rahat dene ke liye ye ye ek ek panchwa ved avishkrit kiya ja raha hai khas taur se actors ke manual ke roop mein natya shastra mooltah likha gaya unke liye pura shastra ek एक एक सर्वांगीण ग्रंथ है जो हमारे एस्थेटिक्स का संगीत का अभिनय का और भी जितनी कलाएं हो सकती हैं नृत्य कला विशेष रूप से और इतना इतना बड़ा ग्रंथ इतना विशाल का व्यवस्थित ग्रंथ जिसमें कि हमारा सारा चिंतन और सारी जो प्रायोगिक परंपरा है उसको लेकर के और एक साइंटिफिक डिस्कोर्स बनाया गया हो अन्य किसी देश में इस तरह का कोई ग्रंथ इतना प्राचीन नहीं लिखा गया A music composer must have the knowledge of poetry. A dancer must have the knowledge both of poetry and music. But an actor must know the rasas of poetry, music and dance. The art of acting can give freedom from the bondages of life. Hence liberation is at the feet of Natraj. In fact, the whole universe is dancing in the form of Natraj.
the world is but a mirror image of Natraj. The goal of Indian art is to penetrate into the innermost rasa of being. हमारे यहां सिद्धांत हर जगह एक ही है दर्शन में जो परब्रह्म है द समम बोनम जीवन का सबसे बड़ा लक्ष्य मुक्ति का अधिष्ठान जो परब्रह्म है वही जो है संगीत शास्त्र में नाद ब्रह्म है वही व्याकरण शास्त्र में अक्षर ब्रह्म है और वही चित्रकला में आकर के वही चित्र ब्रह्म हो जाता है उसी को चित्र ब्रह्म कहा गया है और उसी को जो है मूर्ति कला में उसी को दारु ब्रह्म कहा गया है आप पुरी के मंदिर में जाइए वहां भगवान की जो मूर्ति है उसको दारु ब्रह्म कहते हैं क्योंकि वो लकड़ी वो ब्रह्म है लेकिन लकड़ी के रूप में है नॉलेज of the rasas of poetry music dance painting and acting the goal of indian sculptors is not just to portray the physical body the pandavas were mighty warriors the sculptors could have made their figures masculine but then the attention of the seeker would be limited to the body hence their eyes are crafted to look within the inner flow of rasa of the indian artist was so intense and dynamic that observation of their art can bring samadhi to the trained mind the artist would do mantra recitation meditation and practice austerity for months before asking the devta please come in my dream to reveal what form i should create मूर्ति को जब समझाया है राजा भोज ने तो कहा कि मूर्ति मूर्ति को मूर्ति कहते क्यों है मूर्ति का लक्षण क्या है स्वाकार लक्षण होती है मूर्ति माने उस देवता का आकार ही उसका लक्षण है पहले तो ये कहा कि मूर्ति की जरूरत क्या है कि उपास्य जो होता है उसका जब तक आपके सामने नाम रूप नहीं होगा आप उपासना करेंगे कैसे उपासना हवा में तो होती नहीं है जब आप किसी की पूजा करना चाहेंगे अर्चना करने करना चाहेंगे तो जो समर्च है उसका कोई रूप होना चाहिए आपके सामने तो कहा फिर रूप कैसे बनाएंगे क्योंकि रूप तो जो है नेत्रों का विषय है जब आपने देखा ही नहीं भगवान को तो भगवान का रूप कैसे बनाएंगे जो आकार मेरे मन में बस जाएगा वही हमारा भगवान है तो इसलिए दस चित्रकारों से शंकर को बनवाइए तो दस प्रकार के शंकर बनेंगे लेकिन ये थोड़ो है कि उनकी पूजा करने से ज्यादा पुण्य आपको मिल जाएगा और दूसरे मोहल्ले वाले से कम मिलेगा इसलिए कि मूर्ति जो है स्वाकार लक्षण होती है दीज आर नॉट मियरली आइडल्स दे आर एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ प्रोफाउंड एक्सपीरियंसिस ऑफ ह्यूमन एवोल्यूशन आफ्टर क्रिएटिंग द आइडल डिवाइन पावर इज इंफ्यूज इन दम through pran pratishtha after this ceremony the idols are not simply sculptures but living gods the deity is then worshiped with poetry music dance and drama this is the meaning of idol worship some creations of modern art look distorted dr ramachandran says these are not distortions but reality overemphasized its purpose is to influence the brain in certain ways this was also done by the ancient indian artists well i'll just say there are multiple areas vision is not you look at visual areas it's not just the picture optical image in the eye retina goes through the nerve a screen there and it's displayed on the screen and you see it that's not people believe that's not true what happens is you get various aspects of visual information color form shape motion depth analyzed by different areas you get in 30 areas special for different aspects of vision 30 maps complete maps or partial maps of the visual world they interact with each other and then create the creative process vision involves an opinion on the state of affairs in the world not a passive reaction to the input and if if it did not involve all these areas you just had a screen and you just play it on the screen you see it then there won't be any art and because of all this processing the artist can go in 
and more optimally stimulate this area by changing the image, departing from realism. Here in this deity, the large expressing eyes have overshadowed all other body parts. Ancient yogis and tantrics knew the technique of creating a particular divine rasa by enhancing a particular form. Not a photograph, but an exaggerated version of exactly certain key attributes of that. Devote rasa. We want to activate different areas differentially, more optimally, more powerfully, producing multiple stages of activation, creating what I say, multiple mini ahas. Ah, ah, ah. All happening on a compressed time scale, a matter of seconds. And then it's a final aha of complex of object recognition and enlightenment. <laughs> This can be called an ultra-modern exhibition of art because here the audience becomes a part of the performance. The performance at a temple has greater impact than in a gallery of modern art. The architecture of the temple is a model of cosmic architecture. This aspect is not present in the architecture of modern galleries of art. The deity, the adornments, music, dance and drama in the temple provide an opportunity for the audience to be part of it. Its purpose is to experience the rasa of cosmic creation. In doing so, the audience starts emulating the creator and learns to be detached like him. This Chola Bronze Nataraja, which the English, colonial English, had no understanding of whatsoever. Bird would look at this and said, I call it a multi armed monstrosity. Impossible, it's a monstrosity. We're making a classic mistake, confusing art with realism. Art has nothing to do with realism. I can take a $5 camera, these days, even just my, my cell phone, and take a worthless photograph of you or you or anybody here. It would be worth nothing. It's not a work of art. The goal of art is to capture the spirit or essence of something, what we call rasa. Evoke a specific mood or sentiment in the viewer's brain. How you go from the object, the external world, to the brain and evoke rasa, and nobody says in the brain, that's a misconception. Evokes rasa, God knows where, but you, you brain, using the brain as, as, a, as a vehicle to, to resonate to, to this attribute, if you call it rasa. And uh, Bird would completely miss the point of the Nataraja, the metaphorical nuances. People have waxed eloquent about this. I'm not an art historian, but you know, people like uh, Zimmer, Anand Kumar Swami, most recently Nagaswami, who's written admirably on, on, on Shiva, you know, reading it brings, you, brings tears to your eyes. There's a connoisseurship of, of, of great art. And Shiva and of course, you know, Bird would just saw a circle and then holding this man standing there with multiple legs and, and, and feet and arms with fire and you couldn't make no sense of it. But if you understand the, the poetry and the allegory, but even visually it works beautifully because there's poise and balance, you know, raising one leg and one leg is half bent, there's poise and then his eyes are tranquil, the sense of peace and tranquility. But in the midst of all the agitation of the universe, because the fire, the ring of fire, the dance, evokes the frenzy and agitation of dance, the phenomena of the universe, which are always in a constant state of agitation, the agitation of molecules and, and cells in your body, the flame in one hand evoking the idea of destruction, the fire of destruction, on the other hand, the tambour is, is the rhythm of creation and, and being born, and creation and destruction balance each other out, so this perfect balance conceptually and also literally is standing in a balanced pose, but the hair is flying off in different directions. So there is this centrifugal energy. So there's this agitation and motion. At the same time, there's peace and tranquility. In the midst of all this agitation, the central truth of God, something immortal and, and uni, 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 one. 
This the artist has conveyed brilliantly in that. How the, how the guy thought of this? Only through divine inspiration, once, so to speak. To have conceived of such, a, such an entity, just, to me, is astonishing. And then if we can go on and on like that, you know, Natraja is, there's a demon below his left foot. He's crushing this demon. This demon is the demon of, of ignorance, illusion, maya. What is this ignorance? Ignorance that all of us scientists, and indeed non-scientists, suffer from, which is there's this brief appearance, there's this events going on in the world, and I appear briefly, inspect the world from where I am, and I'm gone. It's called death. What the Chola artist is trying to tell you through the Natraja is, no, you are not an aloof spectator. You're part of this great dance of Shiva. So there is no birth, there's no death. You're part of the eternal, continuous cycle of creation and destruction, enlightenment, and give up the maya, the illusion that you are aloof and you are different from the rest of the cosmos. You're part of the cosmic dance. Lose your fear, abhaya. So, so all of this is conveyed by that bronze. And this guy looks at it and it says, he's got multiple arms and legs. Equal would be if I had gone to a museum in, in, in Europe and looked at angels in Renaissance painting and said, this is a monstrosity, because human beings don't sprout wings. And in fact, I can tell you as a medical person that, that people sprouting an additional leg can happen. You see it in, 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 in older teratology literature, anat anatomical literature. Human beings sprouting wings is an absurdity. It never happens. It can't happen. So that's more of a monstrosity, an angel, than, than a... Right? But this irony is, of course, lost on these guys. So there's, there's dozens of examples, and, and it, it, it's very important to realize this, that, that our culture is, 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 has this rich, uh, harmonious resonance between different aspects of culture, which is quite unique, I think. In the West, you have obviously you have cultural traditions, you have dance, your music, your great architecture, literature, and all that. But they're different, they're somewhat isolated from each other. If you want to go to dance, you go to a ballet. You go to disco dance one on one. Literature, you go and read Shakespeare or you read uh, Keats or Milton or whatever your, your favorite literature is. What you find in India is all these facets of culture. The same temple I went to, Kabbalishwaran Temple, which is about a 20 minute walk from here. You go there, and then you, you open the door, there's two people dancing, Bharatanatyam performance. He's dancing, and then to a song that was composed maybe a thousand years ago. And that classification of that, and the power it has over your mind, in evoking highly specific emotions, like, you know, warlike emotion, like Atana, or something more like uh, uh, Aberi, which is more sort of global, and very hard to describe it in words, because the different brain process involved in the right hemisphere for music. It has its own language. And then merging that with the words, the literature and the poetry of Tagaya or Musami Dikshadar or any of these great poets, Kabir. And, and to do all that creates this pleasing and harmonious resonance between different facets of, of culture. Music, mythology, poetry, literature, uh, all, of this, all of these facets which are, remain isolated in the West. By, by accident, by circumstance, resonate, continue to resonate in, in, in the human brain in, in India alone. So this pleasing resonance is set up, and that is especially powerful in its impact on the, on the brain and well-being of, of humans. And this is what makes in Hindu culture unique. To experience the supreme rasa, visit not a theatre, but an ancient Indian temple. Even if there is no performance going on, just look at the beauty of an idol. Many of the colors are contained within them. Temples are the confluence of all Indian arts. And the idols are that of the rasas. Temples and idol worship made India the most prosperous and culturally rich country. India's multiple languages to create poetry, its various forms of music and dance, 
and its many forms of dramas are not found anywhere else in the world. When many idols were mutilated and their abodes destroyed, the Natya Mandapas were desecrated and Natya Shastra was lost. And thus began a deterioration in the classical arts. But now, after centuries, Natya Shastra has been rediscovered. New theatres have been built, but the Devtas, according to the Natya Shastra, are absent on stage. Now the arts no longer create divine feelings for the world. Some tribal cultures still have devtas in their performances, but some tribals are being converted to other religions. The devtas of these fields and farms may not remain here for long. When devtas are not pleased on stage, or when their abodes are destroyed, where do they go? The rishis say that they make the trees their home. For example, Vishnu finds his restful place on people trees. Indra on Shirish, the sun on Neem, and so on. But people are cutting the trees mindlessly. They are in fact only hurting the Devtas. Devtas dwell in animals also, but people slaughter them for pleasure too. Where would the Devtas go in the end? Devtas adore the land of Bharat. They all want to be born here. Lord Vishnu the Preserver says, I always reside in Bharat Varsh. But India is facing challenges of further divisions. Where would the Devtas go in the end? This is a script in whose letters the Devtas reside. It is called Devnagri. Yogis form these letters on the lotus petals of their conscious beings and attain renunciation. It is an irony today that many people write Hindi and Sanskrit in the Roman script and the Devtas are being saddened again. Indians have known many ways to appease the Devtas. They please them with songs and dance. Devtas also rejoice with them. And the foremost Devta is a woman. Only Hindus have their most powerful Devta in the form of a female. She is the mightiest of all warriors. All the Devtas draw their power from her. Every woman is considered a part of her persona. Devtas like to reside where women live happily. Devtas are devotees of truth. They are different forms of the same truth. In India, there is unity in diversity. But where is the unity of India? India's unity is truth, and diversity are the Devtas. This concept of unity in diversity comes from this hymn of the Rig Ved. It says that truth is only one, and realized persons call it by the many names of Devtas, like Indra, Mitra, Agni, Varun, and so on. Therefore, the diversity of Indian culture is rooted in the diversity of the Devtas. The Devtas of clan and of the villages. The Devtas of trees, forests and cities. The Devtas of rivers and mountains. The vast variety of Devtas and their stories are unique to India. Devta and beauty both pivot around diversity. The beauty of any temple lies in the diversity of its architectural style. Satyam, truth 
and Shivam are one, but there is diversity in Sundaram, beauty. Another uniqueness of Indian culture is Vaad, debate. Debate is possible when there are two or more. Debate helps sharpen our logic and this leads to the truth. Nonviolence, ahimsa, is not the pinnacle of India. Truth is, Bran jai par vachan na jai. To uphold the truth, many Indians have sacrificed their lives. Truth always triumphs. Satya me vajayate. Satya nash, or obliteration of truth, is considered an abuse in India. Industrialization has ruined biodiversity and polluted the environment. Religious conversion has also destroyed the diversity of devtas and blocked the ancient path of truth. The moment it is believed that one God is truth, then existence gets divided. One God and the one who believes in God. The world view of the oneness of existence gets fragmented. This fragmented worldview has become the basis of modern science and social sciences where the world is only human-centric. But in Vedant, the one all-pervading Brahma is realized through the concept of negation, Neti Neti, Mahavakya, the great declaration of the Upanishads is not that Brahma is one, but I am Brahm, Aham Brahmasmi. The worshipper of the Devta says, O Ishwar, you are not separate from me. Devtas do not exist independent of Brahma. Brahma cannot be brought into cognizance in practical life, but is experienced through many Devtas. Therefore, for daily practice, Adi Shankaracharya established Panchayatan temples which had five primal devtas in every village of India. The business of life goes on with Vyavaharik Satta, functional reality. The world functions with the existence of humans, devtas and asuras or demons. The eternal fight between the devtas and asuras is the functional reality of the world. जैसे देवताओं और असुरों का परस्पर संग्राम होता है जैसे कौरवों का पांडवों का युद्ध होता है जैसे भगवान श्री राम और रावण का युद्ध होता है इसी तरह अगर हम लोग अपने मन को झांक कर देखें तो इसमें भी सद असद वृत्तियों का युद्ध होता है जिस रथ के सौरज धीरज दो पहिए हैं उसी रथ की ध्वजा पता का सत्य और शील है हम स्वयं सत्य का जीवन तो जिए पर औरों के साथ सील भरा व्यवहार करें वैराग्य का बल हो वैराग्य का बल होगा तो विवेक होगा तो बल विवेक और दम माने इंद्रिय संयम और परोपकार ये चार घोड़े हैं और इन चारों घोड़ों को क्षमा कृपा समता की सम्मिलित रज्जु से व्यवस्थित किया जाए रावण आदि राक्षस यही हमारे दुर्गुण और दुर्भाव हैं इनको पराजित करना हो तो कैसे तब भगवान कहते हैं कि धर्मा रूढ़ होकर चले In a classical temple, the supreme devta is placed in the sanctum sanctorum, and on the outer walls, there are scenes of devtas and asuras at war, the Ram Ravan war, and the Mahabharat war. The depiction teaches us that humans should emulate the devtas, who are alert and clever, and have the resolution to ensure victory. According to Hindu philosophy, at the time of the churning of oceans. Devtas dealt with the demons cleverly. Alert as they were, they took away all the precious things that came out of the churning. Lakshmi was taken by Vishnu, the elephant Iravat by Indra, and the cow Kamdhenu by Brahma. United, 
They were cautious, determined, and clear in their goal. It is quite the reverse in India today. The evil-minded are clever, alert, and united, whereas the gentle ones are often confused and unguarded. These idols are in Thailand. In India, the evil-minded have removed the inspiring sources of the righteous ones. The righteous people are divided in their thoughts. In Sanskrit, division is called vibhakt. The opposite of vibhakt is bhakt, united. <laughs> Bhakti, uniting devotion, has kept India culturally united. Bhakti originated from the Vedas and turned into a mass movement in Dravidland and later was spread across India. The saints of the Bhakti movement were from all sections of society. It was the largest social reform movement in the world. The Bhakti movement revolutionized temple architecture. Temples became centers of culture and education and were spread across every village of India. With local innovations in temples, India's cultural diversity reached its zenith. The panorama of cultural diversity and dharmic unity created by the temples would not have been possible through a king or a state. A temple became a Tirtha, and every Tirtha became the hub of temples. People from the north went on pilgrimage to the south, and from the south to the north, from east to west, and west to east. The idol of Hinglaj temple in Baluchistan was brought from Bengal. Many priests of the south are seen today at Kashi, Mathura, Nepal, and Badrinath. The Brahmins of Rameshwaram and Tanjavur temples came from the north. The prosperous temple culture extended to Borobudur in Java and Angkor Wat in Cambodia. This is the map of temple culture, and this can be called the expanse of Indian culture. The last wave of prosperity and urbanization in India came from temples. Temples had become the hub of economic and cultural activities. Some people say that we should first eradicate poverty and build hospitals instead of temples. Thousands of years of experience suggest that temples can help in eradicating poverty. During the period in which the temples were built, India was the most prosperous nation with 34% of the world's GDP. During the realm of temples, Indians were prosperous, healthy, and happy. There is no equivalent in the history of the world. Their technical knowledge was very advanced. This type of cutting and carving of granite is not possible without advanced machines. King Bhoj in his book, Samarangan Sutradhar, mentions the name of various machines. Humans built temples to please the devtas, and devtas fulfilled the emotional needs of humans. Temples became the laboratories of Natya Shastra. Temples were instruments for introducing humans to their rasaful existence. The realization of Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, all at once, is possible at one place called Bharat. Some scholars look for the oppressor and the oppressed in the temple system. They neither understand the administration of temples nor the minds of their devotees. The politics and economics of any system are created by the minds of their people. 
These temples are not the abodes of a god in the sky seeking to punish non-believers. The deities are the forms of different powers of nature which are experienced by all humans. A single devta does not possess all the powers. There is a division of power. Some have the power of intellect, others of strength, some of beauty. One provides Ayurveda, another rainwater, while others give light and energy. They are all a family working to nurture us all. Temples are the expression of our gratitude towards them. Vedas are replete with the songs of gratitude to the powers of nature. Like the Vedic Devtas, there was a division of power and work in the old traditional Indian society. Only the caste of Vishwakarma could make the idols and none other. Brahmins performed the mantra Abhishekam. The Bunkar caste provided clothes to the Devtas. Kumhar provided the Kalash. Swarankar, the ornaments. Charmkar, the shoes. Rathkar provided the chariots. And the sweepers performed their tasks in the temples. The Devtas intelligently created this professional distinction of castes. This well-organized distinction protected Indian society from abuses like slavery. There was a hierarchy in the caste system, but never an attitude of taking over the other's profession. Traditionally, castes complemented each other. Everyone had independent and well-protected sources of living. It was an ancient system that worked well in those times. The beauty and prosperity of this young woman shows the status of life of that time. Such liberated and peaceful emotions are not visible today. The medieval invasions and the idea of man being born a sinner made the divine human mind sick. Humans are not born sinners. Every man and woman is a divine Devi and Devta. Devtas reside in humans and humans reside in the cities of Devtas. The Sanskrit word for city is Nagar. Nagar became Nokor, and in Khaimar, it became Angkor. This is Angkor Wat. Vat means the ramparts of the temple complex. The first word used for a temple complex was Narayan Vatika Prakaram. Who is Narayan? Narayan is the one eternally resting on Nar, the fluid of creation. He pervades the infinite universe. What is infinite? That which cannot be comprehended by the intellect. Narayan sleeps on the infinite serpent power of the universe. The momentous appearance of Narayan caused panic in Arjun. And he said, O Vishnu, O Prabhu Vishnu, who are you? O eternal Purusha, I neither see your beginning nor your end. Then Narayan revealed himself in his pleasant four-armed figure. Vishnu is one of the twelve sons of Aditi. The light of a thousand suns rising together cannot match his luminescence. The sun is Vishnu incarnate. Vishnu is Sumeru among the mountains. There are five peaks of Sumeru, all standing in a four-armed formation, creating Chaturbhuj Yantra. The placement of Sumeru is according to the movement of the sun. This is an observatory of the sun, Surya, and the one who created it was none other than King Surya Varman.
This is the ultimate manifestation of the Supreme, who is the preserver of the cosmos. Kama kings built the city for the eternally restful Vishnu. It was not only floating on a fluid of Nar, but they made it the most gigantic on Earth. This is the biggest human creation of the divine on Earth. The area of Angkor Wat is far greater than modern Paris. It has more stones than the stones of all the pyramids combined. The stones of the pyramids were brought from half a kilometer, but for Angkor Wat, they were brought from as far as 40 kilometers away. The magnitude of Angkor cannot be perceived by the human eye. Perhaps a rare one's presence here for long may experience it in its completeness, or perhaps there is no one.